Hello, Russ here. Recently I entered the latest Punisher challenge, which was running during the month of August. If you don't know who Punisher is, or Clint Jones is his real name, he's a visual effects artist and filmmaker from uh, Corridor Digital, or used to be from Corridor Digital. Uh, and since leaving, he's been sort of building up a community of learning visual effects um, and uh, CG techniques, basically, mainly. And um, he's built up this really good community on Discord and his YouTube channel and probably other places that I'm not aware of. Uh, and the main things that have been going on there are these weekly challenges, I think. Uh, and he's also been doing these periodic bigger challenges. So this was one of the bigger challenges. And they normally come with a lot of tasty prizes as well. This time I think over 6,000 people signed up for the competition and over 3,000 people managed to actually finish an animation and supply it, which is pretty impressive numbers. And it was titled Moving Meditations. So Clint supplied a template scene with a simple camera move and then there were I think about 25 motion capture animations to choose from. So then you need to design a character and a scene for the character to go in and attach the character to the motion capture data. I was following people's progress on Discord and the level of talent out there is amazing. Um, people working in Houdini, I mean, mainly Blender, um, Cinema 4D, Maya, uh, and um, some simulations going on, loads of crazy rendering, and lots of interesting ideas, which is really good to see. Even just getting anything going for this challenge is quite impressive. To attach a character to motion capture data, it's not trivial. So anybody who managed to submit anything is pretty impressive already. The top 100 and the winners were announced last week, so a massive congratulations to the winners and everybody who entered as well. I was super happy to get into the top 100, so I thought I'd do a little breakdown of my process. For my entry, I used Cinema 4D, so let's jump over to Cinema 4D and I'll show you my scene and how I made it. So I thought I'd quickly start with a bit of the creative process. It wasn't a very long, involved creative process, I must admit, <laughs> which you can probably tell. But I thought I'd start with how I came up with the idea and how I approached the design. So I had a couple of ideas. I had My first idea was something to do with stop motion, and I'm really glad I didn't go down that route now because someone, or at least a couple of people I've seen, have made really, really good stop motion style moving meditations animation. Especially that one with the time lapse and the guy is sort of in the background moving, like the animator is in the background moving the character. It's so cool. So then the sardines idea came from just, I think I just scrolled, was scrolling through Twitter and I found someone who was just doing some kind of packaging artwork. And I always thought, wow, oh, sardines are like some of the best designed packaging out there. It's a bit random, but it made me chuckle when I thought of it. So I think that's quite a good indication. Like if it makes you laugh when, you know, you come up with the idea, then I think you're on sort of like a good route. So from there, I just wanted to get a really, really rough layout of what I thought the scene should look like. So here's a couple of my sketches. Well, obviously I thought, okay, kitchen table, so it's gonna be miniature, and I thought I'd keep everything sort of the correct scale. But then I thought I, it wasn't very really interesting enough, and I don't really like it, you know, when you have miniature table things in a kitchen, and you have everything really nice in the foreground, and then the background is literally just like a huge depth of field thing going on with just like a kitchen in the background. And plus, I didn't want to model the kitchen. It's kind of boring. So I thought, oh, it would be nice to have some kind of like puppet theatre set up. For some reason, my brain was going in that direction. And I just thought, you know, when they do like fake water and and like big draped curtains and nice kind of stage lighting, that was the look that I wanted to go for. I just drew sardine can with the fish. And I also did, I tried it like upright as well. And I thought, oh, it might be quite nice with seaweed and make it a bit more of an underwater theme. but. Eventually I landed on just doing it more of a kitchen tabletop theme with a little bit of ocean in the background. I'm someone who uses Pinterest. I know people kind of turn their nose up at Pinterest a lot because it's just echo chamber of design. I think Pinterest is a bit of a weird place, but with AI on the horizon, Pinterest is not maybe not looking so bad anymore. I actually just wanted to look at sardine packaging because there's for some reason sardine packaging is just really nice. I don't know why. It's, that was mainly the inspiration for like the the main tin. I mean the tin in the end was mainly the inside of the tin and then the label was just kind of around the outside. Did really quickly in Photoshop and drew a little fish. So when you import the preset it came in like this. Um, I chose this animation, I think it's animation 9. Mainly because the feet don't move and I didn't want to do a lot of like really dynamic movement. I kind of just wanted it to be quite constrained because I knew the fish was going to be a bit of a limited character. So if the motion capture was doing some really extreme poses, particularly with the legs, I knew it was going to make some weird distortions. And I didn't know if like distorting the rig was okay. So I actually kept the rig perfect. So the fish looks more like a character wear like a, a regular human wearing a fish costume rather than a fish character. So this one's got quite a nice sort of flowing movement and I just thought that would kind of 
work for my fish character. The character didn't come in with a T-pose, so uh, it took me a little while to sort of figure out if it was going to work to zero out this character, because I haven't really worked with mocap before. But if you select all the joints and then just hit zero, zero, zero on the rotation on all the joints, it just made a T-pose, thankfully, which is good. So, And I'd modelled my character in a T-pose, so let's bring back my character. So I sculpted the fish in VR, in Adobe, in Adobe Medium. I mean, I used to model everything in Cinema 4D, and I've had a little play around with ZBrush and Sculptress in the past, and it didn't ever really click, but for some reason this has really clicked. It's just, it's so tangible when you're sculpting in VR. It's a, it's a really, really great thing, and I don't think I could do without it now. It's not particularly great for, you know, things like the sardine can, and, um, you know, anything that's like hard surface modeling that needs to be very geometric and straight lines and stuff but for organic shapes, and I know I'm not like an amazing sculptor or anything, but I work in quite a cartoony style generally. So I like wobbly lines and I like things to be quite janky. Nice, nice jank, I guess is the category that I like to make stuff in. But yeah, if you don't know Adobe Medium, it's not like a traditional modeling program. I guess it's more like ZBrush, which I haven't really used that much, but you uh, model like this and it kind of creates a volume for you, which you can then pull around and distort like this kind of thing. The, the main tools for modeling are um, like the clay tool, so this basically. Um, you have like add and subtract. Um, then the move tool, which you can do this kind of stuff. It's got two modes. It's like more of a direct like grab and move mode. And then there's a sort of like soft mode, which does this kind of cool stuff. And you can even make it a bit floppy and like do kind of crazy deformations on what you're making. So you, and then you can like smooth things off using the smooth tool. So this is really handy. Once things start getting, things get really wobbly really quickly. Um, so this smooth tool is like kind of essential. But yeah, so I modeled the fish um, and actually I modeled the butter as well in VR, just to show you a bit closer. So yeah, I just modeled the gills and it doesn't really have a backside, it's just got a front side. To the person who pointed out that the fish has feet, the fish doesn't have feet. It's got flippers and they're just bent over so that they look like feet. Um, so yeah, <laughs> but yeah, so there's my fish. I was just using this as a reference. And then I had, over there, I had the um, proportions of the rig, just as a screenshot. I found it quite useful just to have that up there and just to say, okay, well, it needs to be thin and then the arms come out like this, which is not how fish anatomy works, but, but yeah, so that's how, that's how I modeled the fish. And then I didn't actually, I know a lot of people, because they were downloading I don't know, Mixamo and whatever the other one is, is it Daz? These are like character builder programs. I literally just weighted my fish character directly to the motion capture joints. Yeah, I can show you the weighting quickly. Yeah, I so I just selected all the joints and just bound it to the character. Yeah, I think I just had to make the arms fit. So yeah, I just went to character bind and selected all my joints and the character and just bound it. Arms are separate, so I did that separately. You know, I just need the knees to bend. I think maybe I went in and smoothed it off a bit, but that was basically it. And then I, the main thing I did was on the arms because I wanted just the tips of the fins to be the hands. So just this area here. So I think I had to go in and tidy these up a little bit, make sure the elbows were smooth. And then I think the only other thing I did was I adjusted the animation so that the arms weren't intersecting the body um, so that it didn't intersect you can see here so I had this so I pushed it out a bit further I think and then the only other thing I did on the character was animate the mouth so these are these are just um, pose morphs so I did a gill open and close pose morph and I did a mouth open and close pose more. And that was a suggestion from uh, my buddy Ed, which is good. He said the fish looked dead and it looked like a costume and if I made the mouth open and close then it would look like the fish is alive. That feedback on board and did it, which is good. I'm really glad I did that because it definitely brings the character to life even more. So yeah, the tomatoes and the knife and the fork were the only th two things that I didn't model myself. I had a quick look through the assets in Cinema 4D. You get some free stuff uh, in the asset library there. It's got a really cool thing in Cinema 4D with the tomatoes. You can make a tomato and then you can adjust it. So yeah, this is the, this is the Cinema 4D. Uh, so you just type in tomato into the asset library. And it's kind of rigged so that you can make variations. So you can do def deformation to change the sphere. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I didn't really explore it that much, but you can change the leaf size and you can do... Oh, here. Yeah, so you can change like the number of spokes on the actual 
small to the leaf. It's so, it's really cool. Anyway, so I used that for the model. Um, I customized it a little bit and made these things a bit smaller. Yeah, and the only thing, I had to uh, bake the object. I couldn't leave it as a live rig because I was getting some, uh, the leaf was jumping around. But I had to redo all the materials because it was, uh, this is just standard materials in Cinema 4D and I was using Redshift. And then the only th other thing I didn't model was the bagel. Some people on Discord guessed that it was a photo scan and they were right because uh, that's the bagel I had for lunch that day. I used Polycam, which is like recommendation from Corridor Crew. They're just, Polycam is really good. But uh, to be fair, it's quite a low level of detail in the model and the texture is, because it automatically generates the texture for the, for the object, the UV map is just like crazy. It's just this crazy tiled thing. So there was a lot of cleanup. There were some holes in it, like the white balance was all off on the texture. So it did take quite a bit of work to get it to fit into the scene. And um, it's just really cool, which you get, you don't just get the color, you get, I think you get some bump maps and you get this like height map textures from Polycam. Anyway, it was really good, uh, and I would definitely use it for other stuff. But it, uh, you know, it wasn't wasn't like a one-click solution. Um, and obviously, I'm missing this. This is like where the uh, where it was lying on the table. It merged this into the table, so I had to like delete all of that. I'm sure with practice, I could um, work out the kinks of Polycam a bit better. So yeah, and then obviously, like the major thing was the uh, sardine can, which is pretty simple. It's just um, some sweeps and some extrusions. So this it's just an extrusion object for the middle bit of the can. The sardines are just copies of the main character and a couple of sweeps for the rims. Uh, and then the lid, it's just a bend. I used the same shape, uh, the same spline that I used for the extrude of the actual main tin. If I turn the bend off, you can see it's just the flat surface, which is the same shape as the, the tin. And then I subdivided it. And this is a really clever trick. If you um, use bend, you can actually just roll things up like this. So it's really cool for make. If you wanted to animate this opening, you could really easily do it with this. If it's perfectly aligned with the surface, then it will just make a cylinder. But the more you offset it, the more it will spiral in. So that's sort of like angling it up, it will do this. So model this little twisty key thing, whatever they're called, can opener thing with a little sweep nerves. Yeah, spaghettis are just cylinders with little uneven ends. The water are just splines with extrudes thing. And the background is actually a curtain, which I stole from a different scene. Yeah, it's just to give that sort of like wavy fabric in the background. And um, I doubled it up, stretched it with a bit of a taper or something, and uh, to give it that sort of like nice god rays kind of look. So yeah, in terms of materials, materials are pretty simple. So yeah, the main thing to talk about would be the sardine, but just to quickly cover everything else, butter is just yellow with a bit of sub subsurface scattering. Same with the spaghetti, which I didn't get as real as I wanted it to look like. Spaghetti is actually really glassy, but mine's a bit more like a solid with subsurface scattering. So it looks a little bit too hard if you look at my final render. Yeah, it kind of looks like little yellow cylinders rather than spaghetti. Spaghetti's like actually really transparent. Tomatoes came out really well. I used, I did actually use the bump maps that came with the assets, that came in the asset library, but I had to translate it all to Redshift and tweak all the reflections and stuff. So it was kind of like building it up again from scratch, but I, I had quite a good template to start with. The knife and fork, I've got this like amazing fingerprints texture. It's so useful for so many things. It's great for like glass or reflective surfaces because there's always fingerprints in that kind of stuff. Like people are handling it, especially when if you're doing miniature th things. And it's also really good if you're doing clay, like clay, like if you want something to look like clay, like it's been modeled with uh, Play-Doh or, you know, um, you know, stop motion stuff you can just stick it on a material and it looks like someone's been handling it and molding it with their fingers one piece of advice for making something look real is just add grunge to it it will make it feel so much more real you just attach it to the roughness of the reflection it's not changing the color of the object the object is just reflective material but the roughness of the reflection is where you want to put your fingerprints because basically where there's a fingerprint you want the reflection to be really blurry. Yeah, and then there was a few more, I think I got from uh, cgtextures.com, you know, that free website you can use. There are some like blistered, damaged paint textures that I used on these background waves. And then I think the um, the background is just sort of reflective yellow. It's pretty simple. So painting the fish, uh, I had a reference for the way I wanted it painted, which is this really nice, another sardine tin can design. It was just sort of the way it was shaded using this color pencils and I thought that was really nice I just wanted to make it feel a little bit more handmade so I just painted this in Photoshop and I also painted so that's the main 
fish colour, so that's like the diffuse colour. So yeah, that's the bump map which I use for the displacement as well, I think. Yeah, that's the one for the uh, flippers. Pretty simple. And then actually I just made it really reflective because I put it on and it looked really nice and hand painted and then when I, I accidentally whacked the reflections up really high and actually it looked really nice. So I quite liked the very reflective look, so I kept it. And then I would just like to point out, which someone has actually pointed out on Discord, that the worst crime in my render is that the character is just a plain projection. And I thought I thought I was going to get away with it because the fish is symmetrical, you know, on that along that plane. And I worked on it and made it all like perfectly aligned from the front. Well, then I worked on all the scene, and then when I rendered it, I realised that you could actually see the stretching along the side, and I uh, just. I just didn't have time or the energy to redo the texture. It would mean repainting it because I'd have to, after done doing all this work, I'd then have to like do a UV unwrap on the character and then go in and repaint the textures and like make sure that the this side is all painted properly. And I just didn't have the energy for it. So I apologize to the CG gods, but that is a texture projection right there. And then the last thing is, uh, maybe I should talk about is this jumping fish in the background which is just painted in Photoshop I just kind of like drew a painting basically and um, stuck it on the 2d card in the same sort of style as this and I added some more bump um, textures on top which is the same as this so it looks like it's been painted on in the same style as the sea but you can't really see because it's a bit out of focus and the texture is sort of breaking it up it was a last minute addition I thought it needed something else because I was looking at everybody else's renders on discord and they're all all the nicest ones that are most engaging are where something happens in the scene well the character sort of like moves and sets off a lighting change or like something happens in the scene and I, mine didn't have that so I thought oh, let me add this jumping fish in the background I thought that'd be quite nice and especially when the character sort of raises its arms um, the fish can come up so I quite liked it but I think I did it in the wrong style like I painted it like in isolation I didn't kind of I should have just made it the same style of fish I should have just drawn a painting of this fish and instead I just drew another fish which was completely different so in retrospect I should have um, made it look more like this fish oh yeah also in redshift I had a little bit of bloom down here um, redshift's got this really nice just you can just add bloom as a post effect in the render and it just makes everything look sort of extra shiny and warm and like realistic as well but I think it's good to have a look at what you're making and and go through those things in your head like how you would improve it next time even though you're probably not going to make those changes on this one but on your next project it's those things that you learn that you will put into the next project automatically so you just kind of incrementally improve like that by analyzing your own work so yeah I think that's it so I hope you found that little insight into my work process interesting. Apologies, there's not been much activity on this channel for a while. Uh, making YouTube videos and Skillshare classes is definitely something that I do as like a side hobby alongside my regular job. But I do have some regular tutorials planned and some other bits and bobs coming down the pipeline. So, but it's just gonna have to come out whenever I get time at the moment. So I've left some links in the description to Clint's stuff. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out for sure. Um, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.